Hi, and welcome to the Avram Rosenzweig Show. I am Avram Rosenzweig, and we're delighted to be here. And here we go with our brand new intro. Welcome to one of the Internet's best podcasts, where we dive deep into the lives of the extraordinary and fascinating people who leave an indelible mark on our world. Join us as we explore their captivating stories, remarkable achievements, and unique perspectives that shape history and inspire generations. Get ready to embark on a journey through the lives of inspiring people unlike any other. Mitch Chevallo, how are you doing? Hi, Avram. How are you? I'm doing great. And I want to welcome great. you to the show. I want to welcome all my viewers and my listeners. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, this is the Avram Rosenzweig Show. As you can see, we're still grappling with technology, as I think most people do in the world of podcasting, but we'll get there. <laughs> we have a good team. We will get there. I am uh, really, really happy to be here today with my guest, uh, Mitch Chevallo. And and I am because, you know, there are certain people that you you interview or, or that you get to know through this process, and it is, is a process. Um, I find that there are very few people out there who are so at home with themselves um, that they have a disposition where you you feel a great sense of calm when you're around them. Um, when I was doing research on you, Mitch, I discovered so many really incredible things about you and your family. And I, um, I thought to myself, what an inimitable spirit you have and the Chevalos have. And therefore, I was extremely, extremely excited about doing the interview because at the core of what I do here on my show is I believe that it's incumbent upon us to honor others. And I want myself, I want my listeners to honor you today. Oh, so thank you. thank you again for joining us. Thank you. I, thank you. That's very kind. I appreciate that. It's really nice. Thanks. So for those of you who uh, perhaps have been living under a stone, the Chevallo name is very well known in Canada. In fact, it's very well known throughout the world. And it is in the area of boxing. Now, when I was growing up, my father, God bless his soul, he was a rabbi in Kitchener. But uh, he was really into boxing, really into boxing. So we would sit down. I would be seven or eight years old and we will watch, you know, the fights. And of course, I love Muhammad Ali. I love George Foreman. Um, Patterson, Joe Frazier, all these greats, all these greats. And when I got a little bit older and I went to Toronto, I went to private school. One night there was a boxing match up the street from me at Centennial Arena. Mm -hmm. I was in dormitory. And who would be fighting but George Chevallo with pretty boy Feldstein? Bobby Feldstein, yes. That, yeah. 1977 or 78? Mm -hmm. something. Excellent around. memory, Mitch. Oh, Excellent yeah. memory. 1977. Um, and, and, and I was excited because Pretty Boy Felsen, I mean, he's a Jewish guy, right? Mm -hmm. Bobby, yeah, sure he was. Or the Star of David on his trunks. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, yeah, sure. But more than that, I was excited to be watching George Chevallo, who was the Canadian um, uh, heavyweight champion. And in fact, he was world renowned. He was probably inches away from becoming a, a world champion, having, having fought the greats like Muhammad Ali twice, in fact. Uh, Mitch comes from George and that is a particular type of character, uh, which we will get into during the podcast. Um, and he's been a teacher for many years and he's been a coach for many years. And I think it's safe to say that as a caregiver for his father, that he has really developed his empathy and, and developed a wonderful side of his character, which many, many, many people um, have gleaned from and have, have benefited from, and we're going to benefit from that today. So once again, Mitch Chevallo, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Avram. That's a very kind introduction. I heartfelt. Thank you. That's very I, nice. I, I think you deserve it. I really do. You know, you're, you're an interesting guy because uh, let, let's say we all come from a particular core. As I said before, my father was a rabbi, so there was a spirituality in our home, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. If my father brought home something from work, it would be a book it were, or what we call in Jewish a safer. Sure. Your core, your essence, sort of what, what you were born into and what you lived up to or tried to, I'm sure, was a very macho uh, disposition, 
uh, which is in an environment which which is called boxing pugilism. Mm -hmm. And yet somewhere along the line, you decided to major in philosophy, Mm -hmm. right? Two things which seem anathema to one another. Are they indeed that? Are they? Oh, um, I don't I don't think so. I mean, um, I, I studied uh, what is commonly referred to as continental philosophy yeah. uh, as opposed to analytic philosophy. Analytic philosophy is kind of science and math oriented and talks about, you know, the truth, the propositions and what constitutes logic. And and uh, it, it's a lot about analysis uh, continental philosophy, which I was lucky enough to have great teachers in, uh, spoke a lot about the synth- synthesis of ideas and uh, had to do a lot with um, uh, basically ontological questions. What is life? What is love? What constitutes the good life? All of those really fundamental uh, philosophical questions. And when you're in a, a super hyper competitive environment like or, or around it, like uh, boxing uh, forces you to be in. Um, you, you have a tendency to ask those questions, and I've and I've and I've think I think that I really benefit and lucked out. Um, I went uh, for a couple of years uh, to school in the United States and played football, and I ruined my knee. So I was brought up in an environment uh, whether it was conscious or unconscious. Uh, I, I was I was basically brought up to be an athlete. However. Looking back and reflecting, I, I, you know, you talked about your dad bringing home books, uh, your, your, your dad, the rabbi bringing books. There was always great literature around our house um, and, and, and really progressive and thoughtful literature too. My dad during the 60s, um, he would give me the book, uh, Cahil Gibran's The Prophet to read. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I read uh, 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 Reuben Carter's The 16th Round, uh, Soul on Ice by Eldridge Cleaver. Um, and then I did I did some reading on my own too that that took a critical look at the structures inherent in violent sport uh, that I was involved in football. Uh, Meet on the Hoof by Gary Shaw and Dave Megacy's Out of Their League. So always have the, having that internal dialogue to maybe buffer, uh, help you interpret, uh, a, a, and at times very violent and 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 vicious world and exploitive world that boxing can be a very macho world. I was lucky I had those things to kind of buffer and support and and give me alternative uh, views and, and thought patterns as opposed to just being swept up by uh, by the boxing world because it can sweep you up it's so emotional and and um, electric it can take you it can take you to places you don't want to go so I, I was lucky i had those i had those uh, elements in my life to kind of balance the the, the overwhelming phenomenology of growing up in a in a boxer's uh family uh, it was i was very fortunate well, let me ask you in terms of the ontological. Uh, your father fought in uh, over ninety fights, and he did he did very well. He had an outstanding record. He was never knocked down. In his words, he never kissed the canvas. <laughs> so he he was in like a dirty suit. Boxing was his life, right? Right. right. Um, what would you or what would your father say? Who's now eighty six? God bless his soul. He should be well. God bless him. Um, but I know he's going through some struggles, but right, right. I'll tell you something. It's something nice about having George Chevallo still in our world. Something nice about it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it, it, I mean, when you think of George, you think of the resilience piece. Yeah, him, don't you? Very much. I mean, and it, so when people connect to my father, um, it's always, I think it, uh, his legacy is going to be through the resilience piece. I mean, he's just, I mean, my father's story is a re- resilience piece in terms of the immigrant experience in Canada it's it's a it's a resilience piece in terms of you know uh, the relationship between father and son it's a resilience piece in terms of you know boxing and just the courage it demands so in so many different ways you know a, a post second world war guy growing up in the west end of toronto it's a resilience piece there because he was he was a minority as a croatian he, he he spoke croatian before he spoke english uh, i I'm, so all those resilience pieces I think people, when they when they think about my dad, can, can latch on metaphorically to something that they've experienced, right? So, yeah, yeah, we are lucky to still have him in the world. He's uh, 86, but you know, cognitively, he's there, there's not there's not much um, there's not much uh, there's not much of a spark going on anymore, and, and it's tough to watch. But I know my dad's gonna he's gonna survive right till the very he's going to 
be resilient right to the end. So if cognitively he can't hold on, physically he's going to hold on right to the right. There's not much bandwidth left, but he's you know he's still got a great grip on just holding on to life. And uh, even people I could do. do who go to see him now, or, you know, they're still overwhelmed. Like he's still hanging in there. Right. It's just, it's like, it's like the Ali fight stretched out over the whole of his life. He's, he's going the distance. He really is. Yeah. What's that like that he's not there anymore, Mitch? They say when your parent has dementia, you lose them twice. It's when they, does he know who you are? He, no, he, he does. So I, I think losing my dad twice is a bit of an understatement. I've, I've lost him hundreds or if not thousands of times, but um, uh, it is very difficult. But you have to understand, I, I've steeled myself for this because I've been around boxing all my life and any fighter that's had a, a, a long career uh, at a high level, they all, they all were compromised cognitively. So um, I'm not naive. I, I knew it was going to happen. I saw it a long time ago, but because my father is so, well, he was an intelligent man and, and the pride of any athlete. I mean, they have great coping skills. And uh, what he did was he covered it up, right? So uh, long-term memory uh, hung in there, but short-term memory, he, couldn't, he didn't know where his keys were or, or what he had for breakfast or what city was, he was in if we were driving in a car. But he could remember <laughs> talking about the Ali fight or the Quarry fight or, or the Patterson fight or, or, you know, winning the Canadian championship. He was, he was super articulate, but it was almost like it was rote memory uh, off, off the wall of, of memory in his mind. He could just, he could take that, that poster piece off and, 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 and verbatim recount it. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it's, t it's difficult to watch. It's difficult to watch, but, but I know, uh, you know, my old man's going to hang in there right to the very end. Yeah. And, and he always did in everything he's, he's done in life. He hung in there right to the end and he's still hanging in there to the end. So as much as it hurts me, it also um, makes me feel good because I think that essentialist piece of who he is as a human being is after everything falls away, it's still there. That elemental piece, that resilience piece, that hanging in there is going to be the final piece that goes. Right. And even when it goes, Avram, you know, he will he will stand a, a, after death. That peace will still be there for me. And I am so fortunate and blessed to have that in my life because um, we all go through struggle and tough times. Yes. And and, and 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 recalling my father's struggles and what I've learned from them um, will always be a, a real meaningful construct in my life. So I've been so fortunate. Mitch, I've seen pictures of you with your father, and you are a fine, fine son, I must tell you. Just a fine son, really. Thank you. Well, <laughs> thank you for that. But I want you to know that George and I at times had a problematic relationship. It hasn't always been hunky-dory, right? So It's all good. I'm telling you that I have a theory that people who take care of their parents when they're older, you know, you know the Ten Commandments, right? Sure. You know one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Thou shall respect their parents, their mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And I think real respect comes in the form of when your parents are older and they're suffering from dementia, as my mother did. Right. Um, and there you are, and you're feeding your father, you know, and you're kissing him on the forehead. Right. I guess the thing that, that strikes me is when your father was communicative, he was a formidable character. I saw him on many, many interviews, an outstanding man. He filled the room up. Now that he's lying in bed, and I'm going to guess he's shrunken, he's much smaller. Yes. Who, who is he to, to you now? How do you relate to him now? Well, my father, my father always had this. My, my nephew and I laugh about this. No matter what the situation, um, and, and we've been through some pretty destitute and challenging situations in our lives. My, my, my nephew, uh, Jesse, would always say, you know what grandpa always said? He would say, you're going to be all right, kid. You're going to be all right, kid. So always pointing towards the light, right? <laughs> so um, whenever I see him and, you know, uh, when I leave him, um, knowing that he's, he's, he's alone in his head and who knows what happens in the head in, to your consciousness during dementia. But, you know, I, I have to... I have to um, placate myself 
with 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 that phrase you're going to be all right kid you're going and i say that not only about that him i'm saying that maybe about myself too by the same token I, i'm i'm going to i'm going to have to you know deal with his with his passing and he, <coughs> he he's on the road to doing that to 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 leaving us leaving this mortal coil but you know we're all going to be all right we're all going to be all right and and um the one thing my father did leave me with in terms of a strategy is to build relationships right so yeah, he he built relationships with all the people who were meaningful to him in his life and i've been fortunate to do the same and and that comfort that group that support the, the that support structure we have in our life built through relationships is what's going to make us be all right we're going to be okay right it's that it's that connection piece between people that that so many people identify with my dad he connected to them in some way that he well, did he connect in an emotional way? Do you connect in an emotional way? With my father? The the people whom you're speaking of, that support. Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yes. Like, I can see you're very communicative. You're very, very good. And that's why you and I would get along so well, because I'm a talker and you're a talker and we think right. things through. Right. Are you emotional with that support group? Will you cry with them? Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. Sure. You know, uh, my father and and and. I'll, I'll tell you how it relates to my family too. If you knew my father's parents, my grandparents, they were like <laughs> total opposites. My grandfather was a hard, stern, emotionally stunted, but in his own way, yeah. a, lo a loving man, right? My, my grandmother, uh, on the other hand, was so loving and tender and supportive. And yeah, she was the emotional one. And yeah, but still my grandfather, you met, you mentioned my kissing my father, you know, I, he, my grandfather, who was as, as hard as a heart, he was a one way street, right? <laughs> but, but he would still kiss my father and my father would kiss him. So there was always that freedom to express emotionally, right? So that that was never a, that was never taboo. That was never, you know, you know, you, kept swept under the rug. No, if you had emotions, they, you, you could be a man and express them. And that's, that's another gift my father gave all of us. We, we could express our emotions openly, you know, and, and then move on. Right. So, yeah. He, Although George did say in an interview, an interviewer asked him, he said, do you ever have empathy for the fellow that you're punching in the head? He says, no, I go cold. But once I win the fight and the guy's lying on the canvas, all of a sudden my feelings come back to me. And if he's lying there for a while, he said, I do start to feel empathy. It may not be the wisest thing for a boxer though. No. Well, well yeah. <laughs> what did Joe Frazier say? Boxing's the only game where you can get your, your brain shook, your money took and your name in the undertaker's book. <laughs> right. So, so, <laughs> so you, you, you got to know going in. It, 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 yeah. It's like, it's, it's lions and Christians, right? You're, you're, you're in the, you're in the Coliseum. You, you have to be so prepared for that mentally. Uh, and I, oh yeah, you, you have to, you have to go a little cold and, and, and my, my father realized that, you know, what kind of a game it was very early on. It's a game of exploitation, right? So, and the superstructure of boxing is it, it, it's the sport of the underclass, right? So yes. I, how, how do you work your way up socially? You, you got to beat the hell out of somebody else. You got to beat the crap out of somebody else. And and along the way, you're going to get damaged, right? But all fighters, as we mentioned earlier, are damaged goods when they retire. So yeah, he he, he long ago knew, knew the realities of, of the fight game, right? So but I that guess doesn't, you're... it doesn't, doesn't mean you can't still be a, a caring, thoughtful human being. Yes. Look, look at Muhammad Ali and how much love that he you know, uh, incurred and, and gave throughout his lifetime. And yet, yet he was, he could be the most vicious fighter of all time. Everybody goes, Oh, he, Muhammad was taking it easy. But that's all, that's all rose colored glide. No, Muhammad fought to win. And he was a super competitor after the fight was over different story. But once you're in the squared circle, the, the, there's a different value system at play. Right. It's very interesting to see the 1966 fight with your father, uh, Muhammad Ali versus George Chaval. And then the second one was, was it 72? 72 in Vancouver. Huh? Yeah. Because in the first one, uh, and your father actually uh, de described Ali as being somewhat somber because of what was going on in America at that time mm -hmm. in terms of civil rights movement. Right. We all know Muhammad Ali later on, who was very uh, prolific 
he was very flamboyant. He was a dancer and he was really something special. He defined colorful. But in those younger, younger days, when he was being interviewed prior to the fight with your dad, uh, which went 15 rounds, um, he was very serious. And he was also very complimentary of your father. Right. Yeah. Well, well, and he was complimentary of Canada, too. I mean, yes, he, he was. You, you have to remember that his, he, he was reclassified as being eligible for the draft. People don't realize Muhammad was dyslexic. Yes. Right. And that, so so they didn't think he was smart enough to be a soldier. So I tell you about the way, you know, yeah. a lot of creative people are dyslexic. A lot of super creative people are dyslexic. They yeah. compensate in other ways in other in other in other uh, avenues. And w when he was reclassified, uh, he said he wasn't going to, he declared himself to be uh, a member of the Nation of Islam. And um, uh, he didn't want to go fight in Vietnam. So he, did, he didn't want to be, he refused to uh, uh, be drafted. So uh, he was, people don't realize how, how, how uh, he was a social pariah. A lot of people hated Muhammad Ali at the beginning. Anyway, make a long story short, they tried to have the fight in Montreal, the American Legion, threat with Ernie Terrell, the WBC champ. The, the, they tried to have the fight in Montreal to get out of the United States because no, no boxing commission in the United States would take the fight because, because of his so-called unpatriotic remarks. Uh, they tried to have the fight in Montreal. Um, the American Legion threatened Mayor Dupont and they were going to put on Expo 67, which was like the World's Fair. They said Americans will boycott it if, if, if you have the fight in Montreal, right? So, so Terrell drops out because... Uh, he, he's frustrated and 17 days notice they gave to my dad. They said, George, will you fight Muhammad in, in 17 days in Toronto at, at Maple Leaf Gardens? And Harold Ballard was instrumental as much as, you know, you can talk about the Leafs demise, Harold, but, but Harold Ballard stepped up and said, yeah, we'll put on the fight. And my dad got a phone call, you know, uh, 17 days notice. Will you take it? He said, sure. Um, wait, 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 wait. The best part of the story. He said, hang on, let me speak to my wife. Yeah. We, we may have movie night that night. Yeah. <laughs> he, phones up, he, phones, he phones up my mom and says, yeah. what, are we doing, what are we doing in 17 days? And my 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 poor mother, who was like, like 20, 21 at the time, she had four boys. Can you imagine having four boys by the time she was, she's right. She's harried. She's running around. What do, you, what, what do I know what I'm doing in 17 days? He's, he says, uh, get ready, Lenny. We're going to the fight and fighting for the championship of the world. So Yeah, it's me yeah. fighting Muhammad Ali. That's fighting right. Fighting Muhammad in, 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 yeah, in 17 days notice, and they, and they pulled it off. What was Lynn? What, 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 sorry. What was Lynn's response at that time? Do you know what your mother's response was? Oh, great opportunity, right? Yeah, yeah. Like she uh, was all in. She was all oh, in. Yeah, yeah. After my mother was a West End Toronto girl, lived in a, uh, grew up in a part of Toronto called Mount Dennis, which is, I still think today, um, by by all metrics, one of the one of the most uh, economically depressed uh, parts of the city of Toronto, right? So she came from very working class people. And her idea of the Canadian dream was to was George to be the champ of the world and all the riches and fame and buying a house in the suburb and all the good life, you know, um, structures that came with that. Yeah, let's do it, right? Yeah, I'm in. I I went to that fight with my mom, and I remember going into Maple Leaf Gardens. You know the turnstiles. Remember the you know the turnstiles. They were about at head level, right? Going through and the smell of stale popcorn the paint yeah. the blue and white paint on the wall cigars when, cigars cigars exactly yeah and then you walk down you know you have to go down and you come up through where the hockey players you go down into the dressing room level and they come up through the hockey players and i remember stepping onto the board they, they put down boards over the ice the existing yes. ice so yeah that very very um uh, deep and uh salient memories for me of that night like electric memories and my being on the in the fourth row yelling and screaming you know you, you know you know, you know what you said uh in uh, having to do with that evening you said it was very prolific i loved what you said you said when my time comes and this whole narrative of my life passes through my mind which is what we say your whole life passes you know uh, in front of your eyes you said that night is going to be part of my narrative. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I just, yeah. I, 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 I refer to it as like the yoga of the dying moment. It's like, you know, everything passes before it. They, they say that's what happens. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. But not too soon, but <laughs> whatever. No, you should live a long life. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So, I wanna, but yeah, 
it, it does. Please. Yeah, that's that's one of the 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 cons the deeper constructs, my foundational, you know, memories of, of, of my life for sure. Absolutely. Well, what was that like as a little guy, Mitch? Like most 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 kids, their their dad's an accountant, you know, their mom's a doctor. Um, and yeah, you're proud of your parents when you're little, mostly. Some people aren't. Mm-hmm. But you well, were in you were in this whirlwind of craziness. Were you a little star at six and later on in your life by virtue of the fact that you were Georgia's son? Uh, did you walk? Oh, did you walk really high, high and mighty? Adam, no, no, not really, because you, you have to remember, boxing in Canada is not like it is in yeah. you know Los Angeles, New York, uh, Miami, Philadelphia. It's not like that. Boxing, although it did have some profile here in Canada, the the, the number one sport here was was uh, hockey. Uh, Johnny Bauer, the the great Leaf goalie, lived in our neighborhood. My my brother Georgie actually dated his daughter Cindy yeah. <laughs> when they were kids. Yeah. So so he he would be. Although my father is very recognizable, but he just he wasn't uh, like in the public eye every Saturday from October till you know March or April, right? He, it would be intermittent, right? So I, I don't think I got the, I don't think I got the, uh, in, in the community the Harrods that let's say a hockey player would get, right? So, um, and then of course, um, when he did fight, it'd be first page of the of the sporting news, if not if not if not the paper itself. And sometimes looking at your father, um, you know, with cuts and bruises and a swollen eye, and yeah. Had- paper yeah. to seeing that is was was alarmist a little bit and and then um i i would i i would read the article um and you know sometimes i wouldn't agree with the way my father was portrayed he, they often portrayed him as just like a no skilled punching bag and if you if you're ever around boxing you know people say this fighter's slower they can't punch him if you actually get up close and watch it the, there's a wholly different interpretive they're moving at speeds and, and angles and doing things that watching it, you know, on closed circuit TV or at a te- from uh, on a television just gives you no access to. When you're when you're in it that close, you realize what a highly skilled. <laughs> there are no bums in boxing. Everybody can fight. Everybody's got everybody's got strategy. And you know, people. I often get a kick out of people who, who talk disparagingly about fighters. And, and they do oftentimes. And I think it's because of the socioeconomics or this guy's a bummer. This guy can't fight it. This guy's a palooka or whatever. And then <laughs> and, and that person, if they ever got into the ring with them, would think wholly differently. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. You know, it's easy to be a casualist critic, but, it, but when you're up close and in it, it's, it's, it's much different. It has, it has a different, different, different interpretive altogether. Right. So yeah. Seeing my dad every once in a while, but, Walking around, I must tell you, Avram, walking around and my dad was, you know, my dad was growing, my dad let us grow up in Toronto. He would take us all over the city. We'd eat at so many different places, exposing us to a wider range of thought, experience and action. People he met, the characters, people loved my dad in the street. You know, he walked down Queen Street, walked down, George, George, hey, George, George. Yeah, people loved him. And it like we were talking before the, the, the podcast you know, it didn't matter. It could be, you know, a highfalutin Bay Street lawyer, or it could be, you know, the the bum on the street in 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 Moss Park, and it didn't matter. My father was ready to shake a hand, thankful of the recognition. Always had a couple of minutes of him to talk about him. Some somebody would always relate a story. Oh, my dad saw you fight this guy or that guy. Or I was there at the Terrell fight. I thought you won it or what. And and my dad was never short with any of them. Never refused an autograph. Never never charged for an autograph you know right I'm, right one of the things i'm most proud of of my dad <clears throat> when he would go to boxing hall of fames and there's one in canastota small town near syracuse new york you know other fighters would charge like 10 20 bucks for an autograph my father never did ever yeah. once you know he just he was so appreciative of the fact that people you know could connect to something that he'd done something about his life that uh, yeah he was very um you know forthcoming with with giving people time and attention no, he, he was he was he was great like that he he showed me how to treat people well 
Well, you know, uh, as I said, I grew up uh, in Kitchener, Ontario, where my father was a rabbi for 36 years until he passed away. And I think I was deeply, deeply blessed. I always feel blessed to have had my parents because of their incredible leadership and community skills. Like they were unbelievable. It was the old time, Mitch, where you took care of your neighbor. You cared about them. You know, you you reached out and they reached out to you. And my parents were absolutely in that zone at the time, loving people for the community. But as a little guy, I had four siblings on uh, myself. I was the youngest of five. I uh, often felt as though he wasn't around enough for me. Mm -hmm. What was that? Was that your case with, with George? Um, when I was, when I was, a uh, when George was in his prime, I, I'm, I, I'm also uh, one of five, but I'm the oldest as opposed to the youngest. Uh, when I, when I was, um, when George was in, his, was in his prime in the, in the mid to late sixties to early seventies, um, he wasn't around that much. He, he was training a lot, uh, fighting out of town. Uh, I would see him and he was very loving and, and caring and supportive. Um, one of the great, one of the great uh, uh, shares that we had was when I started playing sport, my father was super supportive of me and that, and that worked its way into my adolescence and high school uh, days where he, he was semi-retired and he could spend more time with me helped me with my training, um, uh, had, had great loving discussions with him about life in general. I think that's, oh, where, I, that's where I got my real, um, m my philosophical bug in my ear. Yeah. That that's George, George was, was certainly, um, a, a part of that, uh, um, element happening in my life. He, we, we'd have, we'd have some pretty serious discussions. <laughs> well, like Mitch, what, could you talk to your father about justice? Such I things? Could, I, like I where where talk, would you go in your philosophical conversations? Yeah, no, no, great question. Uh, we would just talk about um, uh, qu questions of God, uh, questions of uh, fairness, um, uh, questions of meaning, uh, questions of um, I I is there an inherent natural structure to life, or is everything a bit of a social construct? I mean, we, we we got into some pretty heavy conversations. Yeah, gr and growing up. Um, during that time period, uh, civil rights, uh, the yeah. women's movement, um, uh, my mom and my sister, the, and all of us around the dinner table. There, there, were, there were some pretty, pretty. Um, I, I wish I had them on tape. There were some beautiful, heated, thoughtful, funny, um, beautiful discussions that I, I wish I could, I could access, you know, verbatim. But I can't. But in, in, in my mind's eye, they were all, they're, they're all part and parcel of, of us getting to think thoughtfully about the world. And my, my dad was just, he was just, yeah, he, he, he was never, he was never dismissive of my opinion if it was separate and distinct from his. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember my father and I, and, and my, remember my father was a product of, of, of you know, the post second world war world. And, and we talked about that, that macho ethos that, that he grew up in. And, and and had to survive, and he and his thinking that that was just a natural order, and and my you know telling him that maybe it wasn't that way, that 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 perhaps there was another way of being, you know, being more cooperative. But he he thought that life was had a competitive, natural competitive to us to competitiveness to it that he was tapping into as a fighter, and that that boxing was in, in some way uh, a representative of that natural order. And and I'm I won't, I've never been so certain that it, that it that it is, or that it has to be. So we we would have discussions like that. And then um, I was I was a pretty good football player, and you know uh, he, you know he, we would talk about training methodologies and things of that nature, which also have a philosophical uh, component to them in terms of your 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 mental attitude how how to be how to achieve at the highest level being in competition with other people of your or yourself like how how do you figure that out too there's so many things i i could go on at infinitum about that but yeah george george was never one to back off a a, a good philosophical discussion even though he did, wasn't formally trained in philosophy but he did read freud and jung and he 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 had the uh. basics there right like he, wow. George, George, George was a sharp guy. Absolutely, yeah. Where was God in your house? Uh 
Well, yeah, thinking about where, that's a great question. Absolutely. No one's ever asked me that. Mm -hmm. But um, now if I can, now if I can only make you cry. (laughs) (laughs) My, my, my mom was a Protestant. Yeah. And my father was baptized a Catholic. And when they got married, my, my pregnant mom got, and my dad got married in uh, St. Cecilia's church on Annette street in the West end of Toronto. And she was 15. She was 15 years old. 15. Yeah. 15 going on 16. And, and and George was 20 going on 21, you know, different times back then. Right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So they got married in in the back of the, of the, of the church ever because the priest was embarrassed. Hey, my mom might've been showing a little belly bump and, and she wasn't a Catholic. So there, there, discussions have got my, my mother uh, claimed to be a believer and um, my dad uh, being a kind of liberal 60s guy that he kind of converted into. He was a product of his times, started to question the, the concept of God, especially after his mom died of cancer in, in 1970. Um, so uh, it, it's an open ended. It was an open ended uh, concept. God is an open-ended concept in, in our, was in our family then, and, um, is still to me now. I have, I have great, uh, admiration for people who, 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 uh, who have that strength of faith to believe in, in, in God and in that figure. But, um, my, my, I'm always questioning in philosophy. So I'm, I'm a little bit of an agnostic that way, but, um, and, we would have open-ended discussions about, about God, right. In, in our, around our family table. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I often, I was the oldest and I would, I would kind of lead the discussion with my parents. I wish, I wish my brothers would have been more inclined to talk about these issues because noting what happened to them later on in life, I think if they had, um, if they had a, a construct of meaning, Either way, believing or not believing in something else, or being able to find meaning in their lives, uh, if if they weren't believers, or if they were to uh, have that meaning through the concept construct of God, and things might have been a little different for them, you know. You know, you had two brothers uh, who overdosed, and you had a brother who um, committed suicide, and then your mom did, right? Yeah. Abram, can I just can I just stop you there? Yeah, yeah, please, yeah, please. Yeah. It, to me, they were all suicides. I hear you. I hear you. I was thinking whether that. whether whether it's you know a singular act that you can point to, or if it's a long drawn out addiction related problem, right? So, yeah, so I, I don't I don't mean to, to to undermine what you're saying, but but in my mind, they were yeah they were all I, I I agree with you. There was Jesse, George, and Stephen, right? Right. What was Jesse like? Oh, I, I, a, a seriously complicated young man. Yeah, he was he. Yeah, I was seriously complicated. He was also probably the best athlete of all of us. And if there's anyone who should have been a fighter, um, it, well, should is a difficult word to <laughs> unpack. But I, I, I think he, he was the one who could have been a, a great fighter. But my, he, he, he bit an electric cord uh, a couple months before my dad fought Terrell for the. WBC title in 1965 and uh, disfigured his lip and had multiple rounds of plastic surgery to make his lip structure functional. And uh, kids were very mean to him yeah. and would call him all kinds of, I, I, I don't even want to tell you what they would say. It's, it's horrible. And he would respond violently after a while. And he was, he was demonized by uh, school officials, the police as being an, individual who was just yeah anyway but but the, he had a t- terrible relationship with the cops he had some he had some uh, assault charges that should not have happened to him he was put away into a boys home in Bowmanville um, and never never found his pathway and then um, hurt his knee later on in, in a motorcycle accident and then uh, eventually uh, because of the pain, and we're talking 1984 now. They, they, people didn't talk about opioids and addiction, but the, the painkillers they gave him to help with the, after the operation, post-operation. Uh, once he was weaned off those, he went to street heroin to to, to deal with the pain. And uh, it, it, it's not a good story from then on, right? And my other brothers got involved. So, but my bro- my brother Jesse was just um, 
he he would have long he would have i think he longed for a simpler life yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you know being he loved the outdoors um you know he <laughs> my sister reminded me of this story the other day from our typical home he drove his 10 speed bike all the way up highway 10 to the uh, and we're talking about a 14 year old here yeah. Drove all the way to highway 10 to the <laughs> to the forks of the caledon and bellefontaine yeah. to stay overnight and fish for brown trout and then my brother and my my dad pardon me and my sister where'd he go where'd he go oh my other brother said he's going to Belfont, and they're going they went all the way up that and they found him you know at like 5 30 in the morning with like you know after catching three brown trout that's the kind of kitty he he looked he wanted for a simpler life and i and i think the the chevalo whatever burden if, if that is actually a, a, a real thing uh weighed heavy on him and um it, it, once you know he, he, he was looking for meaning in life and once you know the eloquent void of the universe started to speak back to him that's a that's a dangerous dangerous dynamic to be yeah. in and, and 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 opting out seemed like a a, a way of of peace and 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 uh, a way to get rid of his pain, but it, but that it was I've said this before. It was the Pandora's box because it opened it up for other people in my family. And you love Jesse, loved him dearly. Yeah. You did love him dearly. Yeah, I loved him dearly. But but like I love that image that you described of you boys coming home from playing something physical outside, and you'd be singing at the top of your lungs in the car. Yeah, oh yeah. Like those yeah. were nicer days, weren't oh, they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't, you yeah. also said that there were times when you were coaching in uh, high school that your mind would go back to those pure times. You, you know, You'd have to catch yourself, right? Yeah, but sometimes I let it go too. You know, some sometimes we'd be coming back on a bus from a wrestling tournament late on a Friday afternoon, and we'd all the, the best times were that were yeah, we're, we would all start. Kids would start singing on the. I'd ask them to sing a song, and they'd be a little shy at first. Then they start singing, and the whole bus is singing. Yeah. Yeah, the the joy, the camaraderie of of sport and physical activity. You know, when I was a kid, I, I have a very, you know, um, idealistic uh, component to my personality. I think, um, and I think that's only understandable when you when you know I, I both idolized and idealized my father. Yes. And, yes. But but that's that can be dangerous too because what what did Young say? that all addictions are problematic, be they alcohol, morphine, or idealism, right? So yeah. Yeah, for me to get over that idealism at times, I'm lucky I, I had ways to do that. But yeah, but that, but that idealist structure of camaraderie and, and fun together, yeah, sure, that's the most beautiful thing. No, you know, that, that, that's, that's the human connection piece we all look for, right? What was your brother George like? Uh, my brother Georgie, if I could simplify his existence to a couple of sentences, I think that that it would be that they were he was um, very burdened by uh, being George Chevallo Jr. Yes, uh, I've told this story before where he was a, he was a good amateur fighter. He boxed at Sully's gym with you know Toronto notables like uh, Eddie and Joey Mello and Nicky Ferlano, who all yeah, went Nikki on to be Ferlano. yeah they went on and they would all say the same thing. Georgie in the gym boxed as well as anybody. It's when he went out in the public and, had, and fought, he did fight amateur fights. And um, uh, when that happened, he, he, he couldn't handle the burden of being George Chevallo Jr. Right. So uh, I remember one, one time uh, my dad wasn't available and my brother had an amateur fight and my brother asked me to work his corner. And I remember going out um, just like a small little club fight. Uh, my brother walking to the ring and someone yelled out, kill Chevallo. Like, and my brother's like eight years old and I'm like 10 or 11, right? And I, I saw, I could just see the impact that had on him. Uh, he went out there and, and fought very tentatively for the first two rounds, but uh, the last round he came on, I was boxing beautifully and I, he wanted to quit and I implored him to keep going with it. I, it was my first coaching job, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but I, I saw how just support, mental support not only strategic support but but having that right mindset you know to overcome the challenges and obstacles that sports sometimes provided and they, that if, if you can be helpful in that it all starts up here right so uh, just watching my brother work through that that night is probably one of my best coaching memories because i helped him there uh, he went on to lose the fight but he felt very good about his effort because he was coming on at the end 
anyway, that, that, I think that's one of the reasons why I loved coaching so much. It was just to help people on an individual level mentally. But my brother was very burdened by being George Chevalier Jr. Right. So yeah, I, I, I and, um, a drug addict, uh, 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 an alcoholic, alcoholism and addiction uh, problems ran in both sides of my family, very predominantly my mom's side of the family too, uh, drinking alcohol. And um, my mother and my brother had a difficult time because my mother's uh, addiction to alcohol was socially accepted, but my brother's addiction to drugs was not. So you, you could see the divide in the, in the 70s that way. You know, there, there are some addictions that people, you know, we've, we've dealt with for thousands of years and then there are new ones, right? So my mother would always draw that hard line. Well, I'm not a drug addict. I got drinking problem, but I'm not a drug. And that, and they would go back and forth arguing that addiction is addiction. And we now look at it that way, mm -hmm. but, but that was the, but that, but that argumentative framework was always there. And I, I, my mother and my brother Georgie were not that close. In fact, when my brother Georgie was born, he went to live with my grandparents for a while. So I don't think that they had that, my mom and my brother had that ID bond. And then the aforementioned stuff I told you about drugs versus alcohol, and they're both drugs. Uh, the, the chasm developed even more. So yeah, he, he I, I know he, he felt um, alienated in, in multiple ways, both for the family, from society, and then uh, going on that inward journey with, with drugs. Um, that that was that was a horrible and dangerous uh, journey for him, and it ended up with him. He came out of jail after robbing multiple drug stores and federal prison, and he he stated very explicitly that he he wanted to be with Brother Jesse. So he went and got a hold of a bunch of heroin, and took it and died. So it's listed as a drug overdose, Avram, mm -hmm. but it's 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 effectively a, a death by 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 overdose. Uh, pardon me, suicide by overdose. Right? What, what, what was your younger brother, Stephen, like? Um, love Stevie. Stevie and I had such great times together when we were young. Was, Did you? Yeah, yeah. We, you know, you, you know, in, in Etobicoke, we used to, we used to, put snares for, for rabbits. I mean, what is what is now? It was Richie Side Road. Now Eglinton all built up. There were there were deserted farms. Yeah, he and I had great times together. Uh, a, a really um, good athlete strong as heck um burned himself when he was young yeah uh was playing with matches and got one of those rayon nylon shirts on fire anyway but but he needed huge skin grafts so he was always a little um uh, when when he got to be an adolescent a little unconfident uh lacking confidence in his physicality and um when well, I think when you're a Chevalo boy, you have to have some semblance of confidence in your physicality to survive in the world because you're always getting challenged. And I always feel Steve, Stevie always lacked confidence, capable, smart guy, um, but lacked a confidence and did not go to university, uh, started working right after high school. And I think um, he felt um, somewhat uh, insecure about that. Um, but, but a hard working guy did the best he could for his family. But again, you know, uh, alcohol and drugs got to him and, um, uh, he came out of jail and uh, died in my sister's apartment with a needle in his arm a couple of days after getting out of jail, after his, his, his wife, my sister-in-law, Jackie said that, you know, let's pursue a divorce. I think he, he couldn't handle that emotionally. And I don't blame her for that because he'd been an absentee father in a lot of ways to his two children. But um, yeah, Steve lacked a lot of confidence. He had he had abilities, but um, uh, and and I think the di the dynamic with me as we got older was not the best. You know, he, I went to school and I was you know the quote unquote good son. I never I never thought of myself that way. You know, I just you know like all of us, we have struggles in life we have to go through. But Steve, I think, always compared himself to me uh, unnecessarily and, and felt that he'd somehow come up short. And I feel bad about that because, you know, I, I, I loved him and, and cared for him. And, you know, I, we were, I always emphasize the fact that we were brothers. I'd support him in every way, shape or form. But once, once drugs get a hold of you, your value system changes, right? You do, you do ridiculous things, right? So for the drugs and anyway. Um, so uh, I, I mentioned to you that I had four siblings. My sister Naomi died in 2015, um, I think from COVID. 
and then her husband died shortly afterwards. And people ask me, how many siblings do you have today? And I'll say four. What do you say? Oh, I, I, I have, yeah, I've got four siblings for sure. Yeah. Always yeah. the rest of my life. Yeah. Let me show you something, Avram, just very yeah. quickly. Yeah, yeah, please, please. My brother, Jesse, who passed in 85. There's a picture of my dad. I don't know if you can see that. And my brother kiss, kissing before one of my dad's last fights. I you can know, see it. It's a beautiful shot. You know, you're talking about the emotional uh, component to our family, right? I also have something he made when he was in school. It's, it's this beautiful kind of polar bear. And um, it's got his name from Jesse on it. I don't know if you can, can you yeah, see? Yeah, I can see it. I yeah, see so it. those things mean a lot to me, right? So I, I hold on to those markers. Yeah, they always will always will be my brothers. Never, ever, ever, ever do I do I forget about their existence. It's meaningful every day of my. I think about them every day of my life. Yes. Right. So and, and I'm and I'm fortunate to have pictures and things of that nature that I can reflect upon. Right. So. You know, it's 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 compelling. One one has to ask. You know, I am very very sensitive towards suicide. Um, I've had a number of friends that I went to school with who killed themselves, and I throughout my life I've con never had a plan. And I think that's the basis of worry or not. Do you have a plan? No, I never had a plan. But like I would say, many many people, many people, I've I've thought about suicide. I'm whispering it here because my son's here. You no, know. no, no. I get it. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but thank God I'm almost 64 and I have a wonderful life. It's, but like anybody, sometimes life gets so hard. You think about it. You know what I mean? What about you, Mitch? Like you, it, it's been at your doorstep. So you saw it firsthand, mm. but you never went through that door. How come? What was the difference? Well, uh, we, we talked earlier about philosophy. Yeah. And, and we talked about, you know, you know, how that shaped my life. And we're talking about suicide now. I, I, I think a question for almost every human being, yeah. uh, you know, with, with a world that appears to have no meaning, uh, <laughs> what's the next step? Is, su is, su is suicide a, 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 a viable option in a person's life, whether it's the actual physical act itself or if it's even like a psychological suicide where you, you let your dreams die and you just go through the motions the rest of your life. Yeah. The, 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 the different types of suicide in our lives. Uh, but but I, I had, I can articulate these things. I think my brothers had these same questions. My mom had these same, but they couldn't articulate it. They, they, they couldn't give it um, they, 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 any ideation, meaningful ideation in their own life. Because when you, when you do question the universe and the universe gives you nothing back, <laughs> the, it, it's, I spoke to about it as the eloquent void before. You, you, then you start listening, oh, I'm going to go there. But if, if, you've, if you've had uh, access to people who've talked about it, you know, and, and it, it's, it, it was, remember in 1985 when my brother took his own life, you know, teenage suicide, that was like taboo. People didn't talk yes. about it. They Correct. put it in the closet, right? E even the fact... Even the concept of, of of teenage or adolescent depression was like, how can I, you're young, you got everything. In, but, you know, now we look at it way more thoughtfully and way more, um, uh, there's way more uh, divergence and diversity and thought about these things and approaches you should take. But, I, I you know, I, just the, the not talking about it bit, I think was very problematic in, in my family. I, th I think you have to have these, concepts constructs out in the open right so yeah i i have i ever thought about killing myself um i have not thought about killing myself but i have thought about suicide if that makes any sense to you yeah i know it does i get that yes yeah so and, and, I, and i and i i think that's the same for a lot of people too. i would argue that too yeah, yes yeah. Yeah, it's for sure. I mean, you know, when you're when you're faced with a horrible situation, you know, and you don't see, you, you don't see a meaningful way to get out of it, you know, that then you then you start thinking about, you know, 
radical options, right? But if 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 we talk about these things openly and show how that's not the best course of action, how there are alternatives, there are always alternatives, and that the, your situation isn't like your own, it's it's part of the human condition, then I think people have a tendency to say, okay, but that's a norm. I'm not abnormal that way, right? It, it, this is part of what it means to be a human being. So, Mitch, what was your mom's legacy? Oh, my mom's legacy. Uh, hope. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. She was hopeful? Yeah, my mom was always hopeful until the night she wasn't. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, one of one of one of the deepest ironies I have uh, in my life is my mother used to always tell me, um, "Good times and bad times, neither one lasts." You know the the peaks and valleys of life. And on the night she took her own life, um, she didn't have that construct in her mind. Right. So, um, and she'd consumed a huge bottle of whiskey <laughs> that my good friend when he came over to try to help out said what can i do for you lenny she goes give me the biggest bottle of whiskey you can and we didn't know this at the time but there was a cache of drugs that she you know my brothers had stashed somewhere that she'd found some some opioids and she swallowed the whole bottle right so right um, yeah so um if she didn't have those addictions hope might have been able to prevail but in the end, in the end, I, I'm, I, what I hope to take from my mother's life is that, you know, it, it was a mistake. It was a mistake. And, she, and, and the ramifications of my mother's suicide, uh, 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 you know, hurt our family in, in ways that, it, you know, that I'm not even aware of. Like there's all kinds of, there were all kinds of relationship issues post my mom's suicide um, that, you know, I've spent the last, I've spent the last 30 years trying to work through, right? You know, I, I you, when someone makes that grand exit like that, right? But you know what? I don't blame her one, one step. That to you lose, don't, eh? No, to lose, to lose your, your children when the natural, yeah. natural order of life for a, for a woman who always wanted you know, uh, a loving, uh, thriving family in the suburbs of Etobicoke, a woman who came from, you know, hard working class, very simple people, uh, had a problematic relationship with her mother. I think that's one of the reasons she wanted the house and latched on to George so quickly. And then to see my dad get so close, get so close to, uh, to the golden, to the golden goose, right? Uh, just, and they come up a little short. My mother told this, beautiful story about when my dad fought Patterson in 1965. Um, you know, my dad was the number two ranked contender in the world for, for Ollie's title and Patterson was number one. Anyway, they fought the fight of the year in 1965. My dad lost a very controversial and close decision to Patterson, who was the hometown fighter. Anyway, my mother went to see it dressed up like in the fur looking good, the whole thing. Hello, Mrs. Shivala before the fight. Everybody's <laughs> open the door. Mrs. Shivala, can we do anything for you? Fawning over, like, you know, you, yeah. you, you mentioned the word obsequious you know, earlier, right? Everybody's, oh, Mrs. Shivala. Yeah. <laughs> after my dad loses, after my dad loses the decision, nobody opened up a door for her. Nobody, nobody cared. So my mother got an object les lesson and how harsh and exploitive the world of boxing can be. It's the world of winners, uh, cutthroat winners and losers, right? So, yeah, she, and she'd tell that story so beautifully and so eloquently, over a couple of beers, by the way. <laughs> she'd tell that story so beautifully, and it, it will always, I can hear her voice, it resonates in me. So she, yeah, so, so hope. So when I say hope, her life is hope, hope that I can glean from her life and her existence things that, can help other people, right? So well, was she was she a lovely person? My mother was. My mother, you as anyone who came to our house, yeah, would speak of her generosity, of her of her absolute. My mother had, my mother had domestic. She could cook. You you wouldn't believe my mother could cook anything. She was taught by my dad's mom 
Croatian, right? Croatian. Who, remember, my my grandfather worked in the abattoir, so he would get you know all the organ meats and what they called offal, O F F A L, like kidneys, brain, whatever, lung. Yes. And, and my grandmother could produce magic with it, right? You know? <laughs> so she taught my mom, and then my mom st- enlarged that to, to other cultures and and things. She was a fabulous cook. I, I we used to I used to remember sitting in the house and. Uh, Saturday mornings watching PBS cooking shows with her, <laughs> the frugal gourmet and her. Yeah, my mom was. And when people would come over, they they still to this day write and text me about what a what a wonderful and loving woman my mom was and how generous she was in her spirit. Right. So, yeah, yeah. That, so generosity, generosity. Right. That that's generosity and hope would be be my mother's legacy. You know. And yeah. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah, I know for sure. Did she, did she, was she crazy about you? Hmm. No. She wasn't. Um, no, my mother was not crazy about me because I think because of my athleticism when I was young. Yeah. You know, I, I remember my mother sitting me down. Like I, I went to art school so I could paint and draw when I was young. I went to a high school for, for the arts. And I think she always wanted me to pursue that as opposed to the the cutthroat you know competitiveness of athletics right so but once and i was that way inclined i i I wrote poetry when i was a kid you know i used to have kipling up on my walls my mother loved that she used to sit me down and have me listen to music you know classical music or or great soul music it just she tried to get me to become to take guitar lessons but i was ambidextrous so i had difficulty my mind like I, what side did i want to play on anyway um yeah she 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 wanted to encourage the the arts in my life and and, and i painted a lot but then i would paint a lot of sport right like ath- athletics she goes your paintings are beautiful but why are they always about sport so yeah. there was always that always that bit of a a chasm between us that way and i think she associated me w- with my father so much but in reality when I think about my own life, as much as we could be reflective and honest about who we are as people, I think I, th- I think a lot of my, at least 50%, if not more, I, I'm my mom, right? So I always get a kick out of people, oh, you're just like your dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and no doubt, we're all, all of us, right? All of us, we're, we're mom and dad combined, right? But they say, oh, you're just, no, I'm not just like my dad. I'm, I'm very much like my mother. And, and, I, and I say that not only to honor her and her existence in my life, but also to also to recognize and then the, the truism of it right I, I i am i am who i am I'm a, I'm a product of my mother's upbringing too now my, my mom was uh pardon my language ballsy ever my, my, my mom was ballsy yeah. let me tell you and and if george she and george would have some vicious arguments about life and family and yeah 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 but she did my mom she didn't back down, right? She 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 could uh, she could hold her own with the heavyweight champ of Canada. Believe me, my mom, <laughs> my mom, was, a special, my mom was a special woman. It's a good and way anybody, of saying it. And, and anybody who met her would tell you that. So 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 who who has loved you the most in your life? Probably myself. You have a lot of self-love? I think so. Can I tell you something? Yeah. I could understand why a viewer of this interview might think otherwise. Could you? Like you've gone through a lot of shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's true. But if I didn't have those people in my life that helped me and supported me, what are they helping me and supporting me and doing and loving myself and my life? The phenomenon of my life, uh, of all our lives, that individual piece that makes us who yeah. we are, yeah. a collection of our experiences. If I didn't have the capacity to love it, again, and you met, it, I've had some tragic crap happen to me, right? If, if, I couldn't, if I couldn't love my existence, I'd be in a pretty dark place, right? So the, the beauty and the tragedy and the difficulty all go hand in hand. And people I've had in my life who supported me always pointed me towards that, always the beauty in it. Right. And through that, I've been able to love myself, right. I've been able to say, okay, this is, 
this is the way it's going to be for me. And, um, you know, it, love it. Cause that's, you, <laughs> that's the way, that's what makes you, you, that's the essentialist piece of who you are. It, it's all those, the particular pieces of, of your life, uh, that you've gone through that only you've experienced and no one else has. So they, they've directed me towards that. Right. So, but I, but the whole concept of more, I would just say, I, I would take some issue with that. And I'd say, I've been loved in different ways by, by different mm, people, good. but all leading towards myself. Love, I guess is what I'm saying, I guess. Good answer. Okay. I, I, um, I'm very intrigued by your methodology of coaching mm. because it's very much in sync with a philosophical approach to life. Now, you um, actually had taken a philosophy course in Guelph, mm -hmm. right? And you speak about John McMurtry, I believe his yeah, name was. John, John, who's, who's, who's brother Roy, the former attorney general, right. just died last week. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he should rest in peace. Yeah. And it's very cool what you took away from that relationship and what you took away in terms of your coaching. As an example, we were talking about this prior to the podcast, you would um, you would sit with your team, and you would pray with them, and one of the prayers was that the opposition should play the best possible game that they could. Sure. And one of your players, or maybe a few, came to you and said, <laughs> they, "They said, Mitch, like, what's up with that man? We don't want them to play well." And your response was beautiful. Yeah. Your response was beautiful. Your yeah. response was, "Hey, for you to play your best." That means the opposition has to play their best. Right. So you had a whole philosophy of sports and how to integrate it, right? How to how, how, how to use it internally as opposed to very often what coaches do is they will express it, express uh, one's, one's appreciation or grasp of, of, of a particular sport externally. Can you explain that? Well, I I I, I think you've you've uh, exp you've set that up beautifully for me, Avram. I mean, in terms of the, there are outcomes and then there's process, right? So, in, in any meaningful competitive framework, I think eventually the outcome, the winners and losers piece, becomes less important than the 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 construct of of of, of the process, right? So, if if you want to be your best, you have to be challenged, right? So. Um, in anything in life, whether that's sport, whether that's school, whether that's work, whether that's your relationships, you have to be challenged a little bit in order to uh, to have that kind of personal growth to be on that growth journey. So yeah, you 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 can you can win a lot and not be challenged. You don't learn very much, but when you're really challenged, that's that's now now think think about why that's probably a big thing for me. You know, I I, I watched at six years old my father walk into a ring and fight maybe arguably the greatest fighter of all time and give him a challenge that up till that time, well, it was the hardest fight Muhammad Ali had ever had in his life. So I, I, I think I understand that. And, and, and I think my dad's life and his reputation benefited from that. So it's, it's, this, it's the same construct. If we're going to learn, we want the other people. And plus there's something about the us and themness of it mm -hmm. all, mm -hmm. that we're all in this together, mm -hmm. I, I think um, de-emotionalizes um, it for people because competitive sport can be ah, us and them, people's emotions. Can, no, but we're all in this together. This is a learning construct that, that we're doing here. Yeah, it's physical. Yeah, it can be at times mm -hmm. hard to do, so, sometimes even painful. But that, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, it's all about winning and losing, you know, because you, you, can, you can win all the time and not learn a damn thing. But you can lose and learn something and it benefits you. And, and, and I think people can all identify with that in many different ways. Like failure or potential failure as opposed to failure. Potential failure is a great springboard for learning, right? So, yeah, I, I, I've, and the kids, yeah, so like, sir, what are you saying that for? You don't want the, the, no, mm -hmm. no. I just, just I love think, that. think about it on, you know, on a deeper learning level, right? So, and you, when you get young people to think about those things, and then they come up to you later on and, and, and tell you, so I remember when you said that, sir, that that's helped me later in my life. Or when I, some, when I tell that to my son, then I say that, no, Coach Shavalo told me that, you know? Yeah. It just, that's just that. 
that embeddedness into you know generations and people you've taught and met and yeah and 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 McMurtry John McMurtry um, was an important figure in my life because you know he, he was playing in the CFL when his mother convinced him to quit and go back to school to get his graduate degree and then went on to the London School of Economics and he was Canada's leading Marx scholar in in the sixties and seventies is a brilliant man. You know, and he and I became great friends. Yeah. And the, and the one thing he always, you know, made me feel very good about, he said, Mitch, you know, a lot of academics, a lot of people in academia will look at your sporting background and think that that's a, a hindrance to understanding. But once you realize that it's, a, that it, it's a great benefit, but you just got to get into it, right? You have to be analytical with it as opposed to a fan when you can really analyze how that's been, a meaningful structure in your life, then everything will open up for you. And he was right. John was right. He was a brilliant man. I've watched him. Yeah. I, I, just watching him write. Remember back in the seventies, he, he, he was such a prolific writer and then watching him write and with a pencil and a race and go back and forth. I just thought that things flowed out of people. No writing is writing is a difficult business. Yes, it, it is. Right. You, you stop, start. What's that word back forth? No, is that, and he'd say, whenever you write something, write it such that it can be no other way. Mm-hmm. And to get to that moment, that's hard work. <laughs> yes, that's, it is. Hard, that's hard work. But John was, yeah, John was such a beautiful mentor, father, brother in my type. I never had an older brother, right? My dad was my older so to, to have someone else to bounce ideas off of, and John and George loved each other, by the way. By the way, they loved each other, right? Um, yeah, at first, my dad was, what, philosophy? What do you, my father yeah. said to me, <laughs> philosophy? What are you doing studying philosophy? You're going to be at the corner of Keel and Dundas selling pencils. That's what he said to me. I and, then, and then a couple of months later, he's still studying philosophy. He goes, yeah, now you're, now you're going to go on and discuss whether this pencil really exists. <laughs> Excellent. But, Excellent. But in, the end, in the end, my father <clears throat> said to me many years later, and this is why I love my dad, you know, all his accomplishments, all his notoriety, all, all, all his fame. He said, Mitch, I'm very envious of the fact that you got to study philosophy. Guess what he said? Yeah. And and that that's about a, as good as it gets. Damn, you're lucky. Obviously. You're lucky, you know, in many ways. He told you he loved you? Yo, know, well, my dad would tell me he loved me every day. And know? he would kiss you? Of course, yeah. You're, you're lucky that way, you know, Mitch. I, I am. I'm very, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. I am. Thank you. And acknowledging that. Thank you. I am. Um, I think there's a lot of people out there you know, getting close to conclude, cl- concluding the interview. I, lo- I love talking to you, by the way. Thank you so much. Let's do it again sometime. Yeah, we'll do a part two. Absolutely. Or, or just on the phone. It doesn't even have to you, be a podcast. You know, You know what I liked about this, Mitch? I believe this interview was about you. And I think a lot of interviews you've done have been about your dad. Yeah. Yeah. But and I, th- I think you were very open about yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, but, lo- but, you know, we're, yes, you know, that's right. Yes. Right? You got yeah, it. Yes. <laughs> a lot of people out there are struggling. How the hell do I get out from under this shadow called mom or dad. Mm-hmm. I did. I did. Because sure. my father was a sure. huge character. He was a huge personality. Of course. It took me years. And I'll be honest with you, Mitch. But, but Avram, can I just stop? He had, yeah, to, yeah. he had to be. Your dad He had- did. He did have to be. I agree with you. But when my dad died, okay, and don't tell anybody this. <laughs> I Honestly, I was relieved. Because I felt that the shadow dissipated. What I would like to hear from you is, for our viewers, okay, what's your best advice for individuals who are struggling to find their own character? Like something that your brothers couldn't do. You said that the Chevalo thing was too big. I get that. The Rosenzweig thing can be big, too. What's What's your best advice, Mitch? Talk about it. Put it out there. Articulate it. Like we're doing today, yeah. I, I I think that's 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 public therapy. I think that's a beautiful thing. Acknowledge acknowledge that there is you know some kind of 
superstructure at play, whether it's Freudian or whatever it is, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, you know, it's out there. It's out there. And that, yeah, it has negatives for sure, but there, there's two sides, sides to the coin. It can have positives too, even if it just gets you to just reflect, right? Right? Yeah, you know, we're all expected to act and, and be a certain way. Society expects us to do that. The culture expects us, expects us to do that. And um, if, if you're not that way inclined, if you're not adhering to some kind of, you know, expected behaviors, um, that's okay too. That's absolutely okay. Great, great psychologist, R.D. Lang, Scottish mm -hmm. psychologist, and he said, he, he said, we all have expectant roles and everybody freaks if you don't, if you don't do your expected role in the family, you know, um, superstructures, how to find your subjectivity. It, it's, it's finding subjectivity and individualism inside that structure, right? That's, that's the key piece. Give it time, give it time, but uh, openly talk about these things, openly talk about them and don't talk about them with anger in your heart. We are all of us influenced by so many things by so many things on the conscious and subconscious level that we don't know anything about. Right. Mm -hmm. you, 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 they're acting on us now. We don't even know that they are, that that's, that's the nature of superstructure and family is a superstructure, right? It's an absolute superstructure. Talk about it. Talk about, talk about it with people in your family mm -hmm. that, and, and, and yeah, be critical, but also have an open heart and, and have joy and laughter remember all the beautiful and good times too. We, we have a tendency to, to focus on the negative, but concentrate on those, on those beautiful things that family allows for too. Right. Hey, can I make a suggestion for your life? Sure. <laughs> you're, you're retiring in June. I am. Firstly, that's phenomenal. Cause that means you're 65, right? I will be 65. Don't push it. Avram. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm, I'm going to be 64. I can't believe it. Hey, eh, Mitch. <laughs> Where'd, the time go? Where'd the time go? Oh, it's crazy. eh? Like I was growing up, my grandfather, he was 65. He looked like an old man from Poland. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right, talk, right? Talk like one, no energy. I, exactly. It's, it's a different world, right? It's a different world. I would suggest to you, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a bucket list for after your retirement, that you go on the road, metaphorically or the otherwise, otherwise, and you impart your wisdom about life. Awesome. Because I, I think that you have a lot to say. You have a lot to teach. And I think a lot of people will listen to you. That is kind of the corollary to the Shivalo thing. You know, the name Shivalo. People will watch this interview in part because of the Shivalo name. And I, I think you can just continue to help so many people. Do you have plans for retirement? Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been jotting down notes and things of that nature for a while. Um, yeah, I, I do. And, and, I, and I also want to travel. Because yeah. I'm, I'm a huge travel, travel's the best teacher, right? Yeah. I've had good teachers in my life, but traveling and whether it's, you know, going to Lisbon or traveling internally, right? That travel is the best, but that wider range of thought, experience and action you get through traveling. I want to continue that for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and if that entails meeting people and talking to people and, and yeah, and, and in some formal or informal capacity, I, I'd be very, uh, I'd be very happy to continue that. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that recommendation. Yeah, you're welcome. Unsolicited. Um, if you can, uh, on behalf of myself, my father, and I'm sure so many other people who are viewing this, just whisper in your dad in your dad's ears. Just just whisper thank you for what he brought to us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm because welcome. he brought a lot to us. And uh we who love the sport of boxing, of which I do, I always yeah. have. Yeah. And that was one of the things, by the way, I had a uh difficult relationship with my dad for many years but one of the things that brought us together was boxing yeah isn't that beautiful yeah isn't that beautiful so because, just, what, the struggle piece right it's a struggle uh, what, what you're what, what you're basically you're both watching the struggle piece yeah and whether you know it or not at the time that's what you're watching yeah. right yeah beautiful that's a beautiful memory so if you can just whis whisper in your dad's ear thank you so much from these guys okay i will do so but you go, did. I'm going there with my niece this afternoon. Yeah, just give him a big kiss from all of thank us, please. You. But you did a marvelous job, and I want to thank you so much for being part of this interview. 
thank you. I, I enjoyed the questions. I, I enjoyed it. And I hope we get a chance to talk again. I look forward to it, Mitch. Thank you, Evan. I want to thank all of you uh, who uh, joined us or who will be joining us for this interview. I do hope you enjoyed it and love to hear from you. Uh, your remarks, you can set, you can email me at avram.rosenswag at gmail.com or you can go to my website at avramrosenswag.com. This, this show is all about honoring people because I don't think there's enough of it in our world. I think we have a tendency of castigating people in particular in this generation. And I think that we all have gifts and we all have talents and we all have beauty inside of us. Tell people what you see in them of a positive nature. If somebody is doing something which is particularly good or great, say, my God, are you articulate? You speak so wonderfully. I saw you helping that woman, you know, who was having a problem getting across the street or who needed your help. And you did that so well. By the way, that blue sweater looks phenomenal with your eyes. Say it. <laughs> right? Right, Mitch? That's yeah, true. Do it, yeah. man. Put kindness out into the world. It usually a, comes back to you. A lot of kindness because our world needs it in particular right now. Right so now. don't be shy and we'll try to do it to you when we see you. Anyways, God bless. Thanks for joining the Avram Rosenzweig show. We Thank look you. forward to seeing you guys next week. And uh, part two of Mitch Chevallo interview, that'll be coming up sometime in the near future too. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Avram. Great time. Thanks.